Driven Sports with Matty Ice, back and more fire than ever. And now, your host, the Iceman. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Drippin' Sports, the third week back, and it is great to be back. I am your host, Matty Ice, and I hope that this podcast finds you well, as I always do. We're going to talk about Bill Russell and some other topics that have happened in the last week, and I want to apologize for the day delay in getting this out to you. Just some things happen, and it is what it is. But before we get started, as always, a little bit of business. Please don't forget to visit MattyIceMedia.com to support all the podcasts we have, including this one, as a part of our network. And if you want to get in touch with the show, at MattyIceFreights is the handle on Twitter. That's really the best place to go to basically get at me. And if you are listening in the podcasting world, please remember to subscribe, rate, and review, and tell your friends. It's nice to know that people are getting something out of the show and sharing some things with their friends. Over the weekend, we received some pretty sad news in the sporting world. Last episode, I talked about a Boston icon named David Ortiz who had been inducted into the Hall of Fame. And while David Ortiz needs no introduction, probably in a national sense and also in Boston, this man needs no introduction anywhere. And we found out that the great Bill Russell passed away at the age of 89. Many young people today probably don't know who Bill Russell is or was now, but they should. And when I saw the news, it immediately made me sad. Obviously, whenever a life is lost, that is something that is sad. And we certainly should feel a sense of loss whenever another human being loses their life. But Bill Russell was so many things in his life. It's actually amazing when you look back at the life that Bill Russell led. He was a superhero on the court and really a superhero off the court for some reasons that I want to get into. But let's take a look at him, the basketball player. Bill Russell is probably the greatest winner of our generation, or of our time, I should say. Maybe not our generation, because he was 89 years old, so his generation was well before mine. Actually, his generation was my father's generation, and I've talked about my dad and his fandom many times in either this show or Drip, Trip, and Spill, if you've ever caught that before. My father loves his Boston sports, and my father grew up in a time where Boston sports at that time were dominated by two things. They were dominated by the Red Sox being unable to win the World Series, and they were dominated by the Boston Celtics being the clear best team in the NBA at that particular time. My father saw Bill Russell play all of his career, and he knew and understood the greatness that Bill Russell brought to the court. I think at the time, my dad didn't necessarily understand what Bill Russell was going through off the court because quite honestly, well, my dad didn't live in Boston. So my dad lived in Southern Massachusetts, which was about an hour, hour and a half away from Boston, but he understood what was going on in Boston at the time, or at least has come to understand it now, at least the way that I have heard it from his mouth. But Bill Russell was drafted to the Boston Celtics when the Boston Celtics were about one man, and that was Bob Cousy. Up until that point, they had not won anything. They were a good team, but they were not a championship caliber team. And as soon as they drafted Bill Russell from the University of San Francisco, everything changed. And I want to read some stats to you that tell you what Bill Russell was like as a basketball player. Bill Russell played 13 seasons in the NBA. By most standards, that is a long career. If you look at a guy like LeBron James, maybe that's not as long of a career but playing 13 years at the highest level of your profession, in this case, basketball, there's something to be said about that. There is greatness that is inherent in that stat alone. Somebody who has a career that long in any sport at a professional level, in my opinion, deserves to be considered among some of the best. In those 13 seasons, Bill Russell played in the NBA Finals 12 times, played or player coached in the NBA Finals 12 times. I want you to let that sink in for a minute. And the reason I want you to let that sink in is because the most recent person who gets a lot of credit for how many times they have played in the NBA Finals is LeBron James. Now, I don't want this to become a comparison between Bill Russell and LeBron James, because if in my mind, I'm putting together a list of the top five NBA players of all time, the top three look like this to me. They look like Michael Jordan, LeBron James, and Bill Russell. LeBron James will always get the nod because his body of work is great and he plays a style of basketball. I say plays because he still plays somehow today. He plays a style of basketball at his size and his body type 
that is unlike anybody we've ever seen except maybe Magic Johnson. And he does it to such an extent and so well that it's amazing that he's able to do the things that he is able to do. Bill Russell, on the other hand, has a different skill set or had a different skill set on the court. Bill Russell was a rebounder. He averaged 22 and a half rebounds per game for his career. Now, many people of a certain age, probably my age, if you said or asked, who is the best rebounder that you have ever seen? Almost everybody is going to say Dennis Rodman and probably rightfully so. Dennis Rodman is a Hall of Famer. Dennis Rodman was one of the best rebounders and defenders that we have ever seen and rightfully was a champion and rightfully is a Hall of Famer because he was a virtuoso rebounder. In his career, he never had more than I think it was 19 rebounds a game average for a season. He did not average over 20 ever and his, I think, career average was somewhere between 14 and 15 or 16 total rebounds per game. Those are excellent stats by almost any measure. And if you look at the list of best rebounding averages per season in a career, Bill Russell is far and away ahead of Dennis Rodman. It's a different type of game back then, I realize. But my point being is that he was a great defender and a great rebounder. They didn't track blocks back then. So we don't know what kind of stats he was putting up in that category either. And in those 12 NBA Finals appearances, they didn't have the MVP back then. He probably would have won all of the MVPs for every single one of those finals that he played in and won. He would have had, what, 12 Finals MVPs, which would have blown away everybody. He won the NBA championship 11 times, 11. And that means that the city of Boston and the region of New England has two of the greatest winners we have ever seen in our lifetime, Tom Brady and Bill Russell. 18 championships between the two of them. But this is the staggering part about that. 61% of those championships were still won by Bill Russell. And of those 11 championships, eight in a row were won by Bill Russell and the Celtics. And I say LeBron James earlier because LeBron James gets a lot of credit for playing in nine straight finals. Playing in nine straight finals. Bill Russell won eight straight finals. And you can try to caveat it all you want by saying, well, the league was smaller, they weren't playing anybody of that caliber, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter. He was a winner and he was a champion. He embodied everything that you wanted in a champion and a teammate. True team play. That was what Bill Russell was all about. Anything that it took to win, he was going to do. Whether that was taking a step back or whether that was having one of those nights where he had 30 rebounds, it didn't matter. He had the mentality that we always give Michael Jordan credit for. He just had it years before he did. That Mamba mentality, as Kobe would say. Bill Russell embodied that before either of those guys ever stepped foot in the league. He was defensive all team. He was a gold medalist. When he got drafted to the Celtics, he was late in getting to them because he played for the gold medal U.S. team in the late 1950s. It's amazing to me. He was also a lot of other things. He was a great, great basketball player, Hall of Famer, and he embraced the Boston Celtics, but he did not embrace the city of Boston. I've been on record talking about the city of Boston a lot, and I think that it is, it is rightfully earned. Boston is a city that I do love because I grew up in an area in which I was very familiar with the city of Boston. I went there every single summer, but honestly, the parts of Boston that I saw were not the parts of Boston that many black people and many black athletes see. Bill Russell was one of those people. Bill Russell was a prominent player on the Celtics, again, a winner. Usually in sports today, winning trumps everything, and we'll get to a story that embodies that a little bit later, but usually winning trumps everything, but not when Bill Russell played. The Red Sox were the last team to have a black player on them. The Yankees are notoriously racist, and we're talking 15 years after Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier. So that should tell you something about the way that this town thought about black people, especially black athletes. And Bill Russell being the black athlete in this town or in that town, not my town anymore, in Boston, that tells you something. His daughter wrote an article in 1987 that was, I believe, in the New York Times. And that has been being circulated now because the other part of Bill Russell was that he was a civil rights activist long before people like Colin Kaepernick. He was fighting the good fight, as people would say, and he was exposing racism everywhere, especially in Boston. 
but there's a couple of famous stories. First of all, there's the famous story of being on the road with his teammates and his black teammates not being served coffee at a coffee shop when they were on a road trip and Bill Russell standing up for them and ultimately getting them served coffee, but not ever going back there and leaving. And the thing about it was that Red Auerbach, their coach, was all about that cause because he didn't see players as black or white or whatever. He saw them as basketball players and he felt that they should be treated as human beings, which is the way that we all should be treated. So Red Auerbach made sure that that establishment was never given another chance to serve the Boston Celtics again. He was open about his blackness and open about the way that he was treated. Many white people felt that Bill Russell was an asshole because he didn't give autographs. In that article that his daughter wrote, she talked about a couple of stories that I thought were just mind-blowing when I read them. Now, I didn't read the entire article, but I read enough to get a gist of exactly what he went through. Bill Russell once came home, or he and his wife came home, and their house had been ransacked. They had been robbed. Things had been broken, the place had been broken into, and the N-word had been written on their walls. Now, this is not something that we see every single day, and I'm sure it still happens. LeBron James, I know, in encountered this when it was written on his gate to the to his home. Bill Russell and his wife went to the police, and they had the police come to their house, and the police left. The police didn't really do anything about it. Once the police had left, they pulled up their covers and found out that the assailants had defecated or taken a shit in their bed. Think about this. Think about coming home to your home and have it be seen that way and somebody hating you so much that they would take a crap in your bed. A couple of other things happened again. And Bill Russell, whenever they would go out on the road, their trash cans would be violated and turned over. And he went to the police station and the police told him that it was raccoons. And Bill Russell, getting fed up with this description, asked where he could get a gun permit. And that was the last time that the raccoons came to their home, according to the article. There was also another story about once the FOIA Act was, or excuse me, once FOIA, the Freedom of Information Act, was enacted, Bill Russell asked for his FBI file because there were times where the FBI was called and involved because of the way that he was treated and the way that his family was treated, the threats. There were death threats made to him and his family via letters. I mean, imagine living in that kind of an environment. That's not a safe environment. And when he received the FOIA and was able to get the information that was in his FBI file, the damning part of it was that they referred to him as the angry black man who wouldn't sign autographs for white children. Times have changed since then. And reading the article talked about how racism had changed between the time in that article was written in 1987 and when Bill Russell played for the Boston Celtics. Gone was the overt nature of racism, although that does still exist today in certain areas, especially in certain areas of the South or areas in which, I don't want to say uneducated folks, but certainly people who don't understand that race and the way that somebody looks is not really an indicator of who they are and it moved to a more subtle racism. And I think that that kind of racism still exists today, especially when you hear comments like, the blacks do this or the Latinos do that. There's an insensitivity to those comments that exists and there is a bias that exists and people don't realize when they say them or when they do those things. And his daughter encountered that when she went to Georgetown and she rightfully put these, these people in their place. Bill Russell was a great man. Bill Russell was a great basketball player, but overall his legacy will be remembered for doing things like standing up for himself, marching with Martin Luther King, standing up for Muhammad Ali when Muhammad Ali didn't want to be a part of the draft, didn't want to go to Vietnam because he didn't agree with the cause. Now you can make arguments all day long about what we citizens of the United States owe our country in times like that, but he didn't feel it was his country. Because again, black people and especially prominent black athletes were treated differently than the rest of us, overtly treated differently. And so why should they be down for the cause in a country that has not treated them that way? And that leads us to today. Today, it is still like that in many ways. Many black people, especially athletes that have a platform, at many times don't feel that this country truly represents them. Now, there's a lot of ways in which athletes and prominent people have gone about their business in protesting this country, 
and it has certainly ruffled a lot of feathers, especially kneeling in front of the flag or, I guess, implied disgrace of the American flag and America as a whole. I have been on record as saying that I support those stances because that is a peaceful way to protest. The idea of desecrating the flag happens every day in our retail space, and yet we are not allowing people who maybe don't feel as represented by this country and this country's ideals to say something about it, to bring light to it. And when Bill Russell has been treated this way in his past, and maybe things have changed, but what hasn't changed is that good fight that he fought is still being fought today. And so it's a sad day for the sporting community and it's a sad day for the civil rights community because honestly, we've lost a pioneer in both. And I thought starting the show talking about that was important because sports is sports and that's all that it is. But every single time we turn on the television, it seems we are being told that sports are above reproach. And that leads me to my favorite person on the entire planet, and that is Deshaun Watson. Folks, I have been overtly critical about my dislike for Deshaun Watson for a while now. Deshaun Watson was somebody that I defended when he sat out the year with the Texans or wanted to sit out with the Texans because looking at it from a business perspective, I saw that he signed a contract and the Texans did not act in good faith. They actively took away his supporting cast and expected him to do more with less. And when you are the franchise quarterback and you've decided to put your eggs in the basket of a franchise, you expect them to reciprocate by giving you what you need. And that is supporting cast and good players. And the Texans had not done that. While he sat out, he was accused of misconduct and sexual assault and possible rape by 24 different women. Now we've been over that story a lot, but what we haven't seen is a is a conclusion to it. And all this time as they've been deliberating and we saw the grand jury didn't press any criminal charges, in my mind, the hairs on the back of my neck were standing up because I knew for some reason that they were gonna let this guy get off light. The NFL has been in an interesting place with this case because over the course of Roger Goodell's I guess, Rain as the commissioner of the NFL. Remember, Ray Rice started this whole thing and a lot of other players have been disciplined because Roger Goodell wanted to be seen as the disciplinary commissioner, the iron fist. And what we found out is that the NFL should 100% not be in the game of doling out morality and doling out justice. That's not what they're built for. They're a private organization that is about their bottom line. And honestly, they should leave those things to other entities that are technically, I guess, more equipped to handle it. And so this whole time that they're deliberating, there's no criminal charges, they're settling in court. I have this funny feeling in the pit of my stomach that this independent arbiter, this independent investigator who is going to make a decision on this is going to rule in a way that feels more like injustice that Deshaun Watson was going to win and the Cleveland Browns were going to win this ultimately because he was going to get off relatively scot-free. Don't get me wrong, Deshaun Watson is paying money to settle these cases and he's paying for his lawyers. But what could have been him sitting in a jail cell and getting nothing, losing his freedom, is not that. He's allowed to roam freely now. He's maybe not allowed to play games, but he's still allowed to roam freely and earn a paycheck. And what this independent arbiter came up with was that he would be suspended for six games and not be fined. They have since released, I guess, a press release or a concise, mm, I guess, summary of the reason that this person made this decision. And while I disagree with it, it is her decision and she made her decisions based off of the reasons and the evidence that was provided to her. But here's what really bothers me, is just how problematic all of this is for so many different reasons. Starting with the Cleveland Browns not doing any vetting of this person, of Deshaun Watson, not calling any victims, not finding out exactly what kind of pattern of behavior this was. And the Cleveland Browns don't seem to care that it could continue and it could happen again. As a part of this ruling, the Cleveland Browns have said that he can only use Cleveland Browns massage people. What does that tell you? The fact that you have to legislate that, the fact that you have to even say that, doesn't that mean that basically he can't be trusted? 
they know that it's going to happen again. But you know what? They've got football games to win. They've got money to spend because they have given this person $240 million guaranteed over 10 years. They don't care. They do not care. And this independent arbiter basically ruled in favor of the Cleveland Browns here. Ruled in favor that something happened, but not enough happened to warrant anything more strict. She apparently talked to five of the victims. So what, I just want you to think about this for a minute. 24 allegations. Now, many people are saying, well, he settled. So that means they were only out for money. The people that are saying that have never been in this position. They can't be in this kind of position to know exactly what it feels like to have yourself violated in that way, but also feel like the judicial system, which is here to protect the people, isn't really out for you. I do not know what kind of evidence that was given when it came down to this testimony. I do not know what the grand jury saw, what they heard. What I do know is that they didn't hear from Deshaun Watson because he pled the fifth, smartly. But I don't know if they talked to any of these accusers. I don't know if they talked to any of these victims, any of their families. The Browns didn't. This independent arbitrator only did it for five. And this decision has come down now. There has been footage at Cleveland Browns camp of Cleveland Browns fans lining up for this dude's autograph. And I gotta tell you, it makes me fucking sick. Absolutely makes me sick. I'm all about innocent until proven guilty. But when we hear the details that have come out that we know that different entities have seen, the independent investigator, the grand jury, throwing semen, dry humping with his genitals out against the will of these women, it's just incredible. And just because they signed a non-disclosure non agreement, does that really mean that their human rights should be violated and that we should just turn the other way and look the other way? I mean, what the fuck are we doing here? What we're doing is making it about sports. And sports, in my mind, is so toxic right now. Sports fandom is toxic because you have Cleveland Browns fans who are defending this asshole to the teeth because they wanna see a fucking Super Bowl. Fuck you, seriously. Super Bowl means nothing. Yes, I've seen six, but who cares? Would I give up those six Super Bowls to know that the people that played for the New England Patriots were the best players, I mean, the best, best human beings? that nobody was violated? Yeah, I would. I've been critical of Robert Kraft, been critical of a lot of players, and I'll continue to be critical. But you know what, damn it? They need to be held to some kind of a friggin' standard. I'd be held to a standard. You'd be held to a standard. Why are they not held to a standard? Why are they allowed to live in this space where consequences don't mean a damn thing? And that's what kills me, man, is that just because the judicial system failed these women the NFL had a chance to fucking do it. And now, because Roger Goodell mishandled so many disciplinary cases, this independent arbiter is left to make these decisions, an unbiased decision, and I get it. I totally get why they make this. I totally get why they want this to be this way. Because Roger Goodell wants to take his hands off of it. Because there's way too much to lose for him, and there's way too much to lose for these owners. These owners aren't even willing to get rid of Daniel Snyder, who perpetrated all this horseshit behavior in their offices. I mean, really. Racism, sexism, misogyny. It's all good, man. Just don't do it again. It just makes me sick. And it should make you sick. If you're a Cleveland Browns fan, it should make you sick. A Super Bowl win should feel dirty. And it will feel dirty to me. I can tell you that. If the Cleveland Browns make the Super Bowl, I'm going to say this here. And I will stick to it. I will not watch the Super Bowl. I will not cover the Super Bowl. You will not hear it on this show because that, that Super Bowl will be tainted. It will be dirty. And no matter what happens, I will not cover it. It just makes me sad. This is not a day to celebrate justice. It's not a day to celebrate football. But you know what the sad reality of it is? The Hall of Fame game is next week. And guess what? Everybody forgets. In six games, when he comes back, We'll talk about it for a microsecond. The broadcast may bring it up, but it's business as usual. It's back to football. And you know what? I'm part of the problem because I love football and I love watching football. And no matter how much virtue signaling I do by telling you about this, I don't do enough because I still watch the product. I just don't know what to do about it. I don't want to stop watching football, but it's becoming harder and harder to turn my face away 
from this kind of stuff. I can't look at this man and think to myself, well, he was treated fairly because it doesn't feel that way. It feels like if I were in that boat, I would be in jail and that you would be in jail and any quote regular person would be in jail. I think that's the part that kills me. And now imagine if you're a woman in that organization or a woman that has to be around him. How do you feel? How do you feel about having your kids near him or your daughters near him? Does it make you feel good? I mean, it can't, right? The NFL really, really messed up here. And it just, it's sad. It shouldn't be this way. In other news, last week I talked about Kyler Murray and I talked about his new contract. And there's been a few things that have happened over the last week that are at least worth noting to close out this episode. And it's interesting. I said last week that I would be worried about what the Arizona Cardinals felt that they have to put into the contract for Kyler Murray. What I didn't think is that it would cause such a shitstorm that the Cardinals would basically be bullied into backtracking from having that in their contract. The thing about it, though, is it was it was turned into what felt like a black quarterback thing. And I think that there is some merit to that because I do believe that players like Lamar Jackson are held to a higher standard or a different standard than white quarterbacks are. Because I think we microanalyze their skills and their successes and failures mostly to sort of highlight how they're not like their white contemporaries. Like Lamar Jackson isn't Tom Brady. And we say that he's not like Tom Brady because, well, he doesn't really play well in the playoffs. He's been in the playoffs twice, if you don't count that first year. So he does have some things to prove, but Brady won a Super Bowl in his first postseason. Like that almost never happens. So Lamar Jackson, Patrick Mahomes, although I, Patrick Mahomes was kind of interestingly the spokesperson for this message, but Patrick Mahomes, I think, is not treated that way. I think everybody knows how great he is. I think we're talking about the Lamar Jacksons. I think we're talking about the Kyler Murrays. And I think it comes with the fact that they haven't won a Super Bowl. Winning does cure a lot of things in sports. It supposedly is a meritocracy. And if you have chips, then you're going to go places. Now, there is a distinction in my mind between one ring and two rings. And Patty Mahomes only has one. I think he's going to get to that second one eventually, but it is hard to do. Kyler Murray hasn't really won anything. This was Kyler Murray's first playoff appearance. And by a lot of accounts, he wasn't a hard worker. Now, the idea of being a hard worker in today's NFL is still perpetuated by older players who talk about Brady and Manning and watching like 20 hours of film a week or something like that. It's kind of like school in that a lot of people don't have to study to do well. Maybe this is one of those cases, but I also get the, the, the feeling that Kyler Murray doesn't feel as if he has to put in the kind of work that is expected of him because his skill set will ultimately lead him to success. And while that may be true for a little bit, there is a lot of preparation that needs to be done in order to get to that next level because I have not seen him quite take that step yet. What happens is these teams adjust to him over the season and what we see or have seen is the Cardinals take a little bit of a dip at the end of the season and when they played a good team, the Super Bowl winning Rams, they got embarrassed. They got absolutely embarrassed. The thing I think that's interesting about this Kyler Murray situation is why did the information get out in the first place about this clause in his contract? Because it doesn't seem to really benefit anybody. Kyler Murray certainly was annoyed by it. And you have to wonder who would leak it and why would they leak it? It would seem as if it was the Cardinals because you'd think that these parties agreed to this. But then the question becomes, how does that benefit the Cardinals at all? To me, it makes them look very petty. To me, it makes them look like a bad employer to say, yeah, we felt like we had to put this in there. And after he signs this extension, which we weren't sure he was going to do, by the way, here's this clause that we had in there. It makes them look incompetent. And I think it's a bad look overall for everybody. But I do think that the concerns are at least warranted. What is Kyler Murray's preparation level for these games? And if his preparation level that he's done his whole life isn't working and isn't getting them to the next level, I think it's time to internally look, what is it that I could do better? And what is it that the team could do better? Because this is a, a two dog show here. This is the takes two to tango. And I think the Cardinals have been an inept organization for the most part. And Kyler Murray hasn't really done anything in the league. And I think these narratives are converging. And I think that the fact that this was leaked 
is very, very curious. And I will be interested to see how this relationship develops over the course of this year, because quite frankly, it's in a problematic place if the Cardinals are going to sign this guy, say he's our guy, but then also right out the gate, throw him under the bus. Now, a player that has been holding out for money that I said should hold out for money finally got paid, and that was Debo Samuel. And why is that interesting? Well, in the same week, the San Francisco 49ers decided on their future, and they told Jimmy G that Trey Lance is the guy. It's what they should have done last year. I think they could have started Jimmy G had Trey Lance come in and get some of that experience because that team had a lot of injuries. That team was still talented and they won a playoff game. They almost won a couple of playoff games. So they were certainly good enough to make the playoffs and be dangerous. And I think had they let Trey Lance play that year, they might've been able to figure some things out, but they're moving on now. And Trey Lance is the guy. So Trey Lance gets Debo Samuel. Now, I think one smart thing on his part was they negotiated some running back stats and incentives because they had used him kind of like a Swiss army knife, great for fantasy purposes, but I think really poor for his body. And he became their basic weapon. I think this year, he's, they're probably gonna use him that way, but now with Trey Lance, it adds a dynamic nature to that offense with Trey Lance's skill set. I see Trey Lance as a much more raw Josh Allen. Josh Allen was a very raw prospect coming into the league, and he has taken leaps and bounds steps to becoming an improved quarterback his accuracy has been amazing and I think a lot of that is attested to Stefan Diggs so now with Debo Samuel and George Kittle and a great running game and a great running scheme by Kyle Shanahan I think Trey Lance is in a place to succeed and I I think the 49ers are in a great place by basically betting on their future they knew they wanted to keep Debo I understand he wanted to get paid so now he gets paid they get on the basically the rookie quarterback deal, so they're paying for Lance on the cheap, and I think they have a window here to win, but definitely keeping around these weapons that are going to help Trey Lance become a better quarterback and allow him to grow into the position was a really, really savvy business move, and I think it's going to pay dividends on the field. Well, folks, the end of the episode has arrived, and while we lost Bill Russell, and Deshaun Watson sucks, and that was not a great outcome, there's a lot to look forward to in life. There's so much more than just sports that we have to look forward to, our families, our kids, our hobbies, whatever it is. I love podcasting. I love talking to you every single week. Even if I'm not looking at you, I always feel like I'm talking to somebody in this room, and I love to hear from you. So if you want to get in touch with the show, at Matty Ice Freights is the handle on Twitter. Just hit me up, hit me a follow, throw me a DM, whatever. I love to talk to you, and please don't forget to visit MattyIceMedia.com to support the other podcasts that we have as a part of the network. It's a labor of love for me and a passion project, so any of your support is greatly appreciated. I hope that this finds you well, and I hope that you have a great rest of your week. Stay safe, everybody, and I will talk to you next week. Peace. The opinions and viewpoints expressed on Drippin' Sports with Matty Ice are those of Matt Freights and his guests, and not necessarily those of the Matty Ice Media Network. Drippin' Sports with Matty Ice is exclusively owned by Matt Freights and is brought to you by the Matty Ice Media Network.